approaching the fight here, getting ready for New Year's. Of course, man celebrated his New Year's celebration months ago in the middle of winter, no doubt. But according to the sacred calendar, according to the father's calendar, the original calendar, a calendar that we used before man started making calendars, New Year's starts in the spring, in the first month of spring. Now you can look up in your encyclopedia how man changed the calendar when he first created his calendar. He had his started in the spring as well. But man wanted to create a disconnect between his calendar and the father's calendar. So one of the things that he did was he moved the beginning of the year back to January. He also made the weeks 10 days long, but he changed those back, thank the father. And of course, he took all of the holy days off of the calendar and replaced them with holidays. But we'll save that for another class. In this class, we want to talk about the sacred new year and what it means. And to do so, we're going to go down through the King James Version of the Bible and look for what occurred on the first day of the first month. Now, of course, we're talking about the lunar months, which start with the new moon after the spring equinox. Now, don't think that the new year starts with the equinox. No, on a sacred calendar, months starts with new moons. It's even where the word month came from, like month. So let's jump over here to the book of Exodus, chapter 12. When the father is talking to Moses and he's about to tell him about Passover and how they were to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost so that the death angel will pass by them. You see right here in verse 12. And two, it says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. To find out the name of the month, we would have to jump all the way down to chapter 38 and verse 18. Where it says, for in the month Abib, thou cameth out of Egypt. And we know that they came out of Egypt during Passover. But the first month goes by other names as well, including Nisan or Nisan. You may hear it called sometimes. They're getting that from the book Esther, where it says in the first month, that is the month Nisan. Now, the first month was called by other names as well throughout the scripture. As the children of Israel went into foreign lands and foreign nations and spoke foreign languages. But don't be confused. They're all talking about the first lunar month on the Hebrew calendar. Now, to see the first time that the phrase first month is listed in the Bible, you will start in Genesis chapter 8 and 13, talking about Noah. It says in the first month, in the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. This is after Noah had been on that ark for months. He was on the ark for over a year as the earth was flooded for about that time. But it was in the first month, on the first day of the first month, that the land was dried up. It was on the first day of the first month that Noah was able to remove the covering from off the ark. Now, if you look at my Enoch calendar that I have on the wall, I have the verses with all of these dates written on that calendar because I believe that these dates have spiritual meanings and that on the first day of the first month, the spiritual waters will be dried up from our spiritual earth. And as we go by these dates each year, I pay close attention to what's going on in the world and my personal life, trying to see if there's some connection that I can make between the material interpretation of this verse and the spiritual interpretation of this verse. 
I do that for each verse that lists a date throughout the calendar throughout the year. So we should write this down in our mental notebook that it is the first day of the first month that the waters will be dried up off the earth. Now we have to remember that the earth was going through a purification process back there with Noah. The entire earth was being purified of all wickedness and uncleanliness. That's why there were only eight people on the ark. Only eight people were found worthy to come through the flood and live in the new world. So we should write this down in our mental notebook that after this purification, it was on the first day of the first month that those purifying waters were dried up, meaning the purification was over. So let's go on to the next time we see the first day of the first month. It is down here in the book of Exodus in chapter 40. Now this is the father speaking to Moses and he says in verse 2, on the first day of the first month, thou shalt set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. So this is significant as we think about our New Year's celebration as how the tabernacle was set up in the congregation. Now, back then, this was a material tabernacle, just like back then there were material waters. But today it is a spiritual tabernacle built in the hearts of humanity. But it is on the first day of the first month that this tabernacle was set up. And we're going to see that this is not the only time in the scripture that the tabernacle or the temple was set up and or cleansed on the first day of the first month. Now in the same chapter in the book of Exodus, down in verse 17, we see that Moses was obedient. The tabernacle was set up in the first day of the first month. But notice right there how it's saying in the second year. This is the second year after the children of Israel left Egypt. Now this is important for us to understand in our spiritual journey because you could imagine that the first time that we start to keep Passover could be like the Noah period where we have to spend a year in a sort of purification process. But in the second year, the tabernacle is reared up. That's what we're talking about when we have to look at the spiritual and the material meanings, because there is a connection between Noah's Ark and the exodus of the children of Israel. We can see these connections. This connection is made clear when we look at the dates on which they fell. This is definitely a day for celebrating. Celebrating that our purifications may be over and that our tabernacles may be set up. Now let's go on, jumping all the way down here to Second Chronicles and chapter 29, where we start to hear about King Hezekiah. In the first month and the first day of the month, they began to sanctify the temple. There's a lot of sanctification going on here. Now, up there in verse 12, you can start to see the names of the Levites. And down there in verse 15, how those Levites were sanctified according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. Talking about Solomon's temple. The inner court was cleansed. You see in verse 16, they removed all of the uncleanliness out of the court of the house of the Lord. Verse 17 was talking about how they started all of this on the first day of the first month. And how it lasted for eight days. I think it's clear that we start to see a pattern here. Of how the first day of the first month is a cleansing period. And so we should put that down in our mental notebooks. The first day of the first month is for a cleansing. 
a cleansing of that inner court. And again, we know that that inner court is not in some brick and mortar temple yard over there in Jerusalem, but is built on the hearts of humanity. It is this inner court that is to be cleansed on the first day of the first month. I think the pattern is becoming clear, but let's go on. Let's jump down here to the book of Ezra. Look in here in chapter 6 and verse 19, you can see that on the 14th day of the first month that they kept the Passover. And if you know the book of Ezra, you know that this is after they had completed what we call the second temple. As Solomon's temple was rebuilt during that time. It was during the first month that they went in and actually started making offerings again in that temple that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. You look right there in verse 21, how they kept the feast of unleavened bread, seven days with joy. But when you jump down here to verse 9 of chapter 7, you see the first day of the first month that Ezra started to go up from Babylon. It says down there in verse 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. This preparation period seems to have started back there on the first day of the first month. And lasted about four months. A lot of what goes on on the first day of the first month is about cleansing. I wonder if this is where they got spring cleaning from. When you look down here in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 17, there's a different kind of cleansing going on. It says, and they made an end with all the men who had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. These are the children of Israel who had beforehand married Babylonian wives are now going in to remove these Babylonian wives from out of the children of Israel. They got rid of all of them. Cleaning the inside of the house and looks like they're cleaning the outside of the house too. They put those strange wives away according to the law. Put the children away too. Babylonian wives will make Babylonian children. But let's jump down to the book of Esther. And we see a different kind of cleansing going on by a guy named Haman. Now Haman wanted to be important in the kingdom of Ahasuerus. But when Mordecai, a child of Israel, would not bow down to Haman, Haman became distraught and sought out not only to kill Mordecai, but to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom. You look at verse 7 after chapter 3, it says, In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast her. That is the lot before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the 12th month. That is the month Adar. And verse 8 tells you how Haman went to King Ahasuerus and said, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of the kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all the people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. Hey, king, let's go kill them all, he says right there in verse 9. Verse 9 said, If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And you can see in verse 9 how he wanted to pay a thousand talents of silver to the people that destroyed the temple, that destroyed the children of Israel, that killed all of the Jews out of the kingdom. He was planning on purifying the kingdom of all of the children of Israel. But if you remember the story of the book of Esther, how Queen Esther changed the king's heart. 
And it wasn't the Jews that were destroyed, but it was all of the people that hated the Jews that were destroyed. And that's why some Jewish people celebrate Purim to this day. Because of this cleansing process that started on the first day of the first month by the hands of Haman was changed to a different kind of purification by the hands of the Lord. Now, I'm a student of the word just like you are. And in all of these classes, I learned something. And what I'm learning from this class on New Year's is that New Year's is all about cleansing. Now, when I jump down here to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 26 and verse 1 doesn't tell me exactly what month it is. But by not doing so, makes me assume that it is the first month. Here is Ezekiel getting the word of the Lord, talking about cleansing Tyrus. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee as the sea cause of his waves to come up. So now this sounds a lot like went on back there with Haman. How you have a group of people that wants to come against the children of the Most High and how the Most High is going to step in to destroy that people. And like I said at the beginning of this video, how I believe that a lot of these dates that were given back then in that living parable can be superimposed on our dates here spiritually in these end times. And so for those who want to come against the children of Israel, they should also be mindful of the first day of the first month because if what I believe is true, it will be during the first month and the first day of the month that the tables will turn. And that the children of Israel will no longer be the tail and will become the head. Now down here in the same book, Ezekiel chapter 29 and 17, I think confirms that the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel in the first month and the first day of the month. Because down here we're also getting another word of the Lord that's coming to Ezekiel in the first month. And in the first day of the month. And what he's telling Ezekiel down here in verse 18, he says, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald, every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages, nor his army, for Tyrus, for the service that he had served against it. And verse 19 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, for it shall be the wages for his army. This is the word of the Lord coming in the first day of the first month. A day of cleansing, a day of purification. A day of turning the tables. A day of making things right. And down here in chapter 45 and 18, again, we're talking about cleansing the tabernacle or the inner courts. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, In the first month, in the first day of the month, thou shalt take a young bullock without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. So Ezekiel is confirming what we read earlier by Moses is that the first day of the first month is a time for cleansing. Not only the inner court, as you see down there, is re-mentioned down there in verse 19, but the sanctuary is cleansed on the first day of the first month. You have the house of the Lord, the inner court, the sanctuary, all cleansed on the first month, as we've seen so far in this video. The strange wives were put away. Even the strange people out of the community. The first day and the first month.
is a day for getting rid of all uncleanliness. But let's look a little, let's look at a couple of more verses here in chapter 45 of Ezekiel. Because anytime you're celebrating the New Year's of the Lord, you're also thinking about Passover. Verse 20 says, And so thou shalt do the seventh day of the month for every one that erreth, and for him that is simple, and so shall reconcile the house. Talking about the seventh day of the first month. And verse 21 says, And in the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month, ye shall have Passover, a feast of seven days, unleavened bread shall ye eat. So it makes sense that all of this purification and all of this cleansing is going on. We're cleaning our houses, getting ready for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this brings to mind baptism and how we are able through the power of the water to cleanse away all of our sins and wash away all of our stains on our spirit by way of baptism. So as we're cleaning our house, our inner court, our sanctuary, getting our wives and our neighbors straightened out, should be a time that we should be considering getting rebaptized again. This time, understanding that it is repentance that we're seeking in that water, not a rite or a ceremony. but a cleansing of our sanctuary. All right, so as I said earlier, I'm a student of the word, just like you. The difference is I study on YouTube, so everybody can see my Bible studies. In this class it was quite surprising to learn how much the first day of the first month has to do with cleansing. So let's talk more on cleansing. We understand that the way that we cleanse the tabernacle is through baptism. So let's step down through here and look at a few verses associated with baptism. All right now I'm over here in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This is John the Baptist speaking here, speaking about the Messiah. John the Baptist is telling that the people of Judea and Jerusalem, the whole town came out to be baptized by him. How this baptism, which seems that John the Baptist invented, it was through that water with a repentant heart that all of the previous sins that had been committed by the individual were able to be washed away and cleansed away. Now, I stress this because many of us weren't taught this when we were baptized the first time. I know I wasn't. When they broke those two inches of ice off of that pool back there in 1987, nobody told me it had anything to do with repentance. What I understood is that because I had eaten communion without being baptized, I was getting somebody, probably myself, in trouble. Not once did I understood that I was being baptized unto repentance. In fact, I went out the very next day and did the same things that I'd have been doing the days before. So I dirtied myself up and squandered my repentance. That's why I had to get baptized again. But notice right here where he says that there is one that comes after him that shall baptize with fire. This is the true baptism, the baptism by fire. But don't be confused. There's some who will try to separate the water and the fire. No, the baptism by fire comes by way of the water. You have to have the water in order to be baptized by the fire. The water is to the body as the fire is to the spirit. To say that the water cleans your body as that fire cleans your spirit, but they go hand in hand. 
Now, you look right here in the book of Luke in chapter 3, and it appears as though John the Baptist is refusing to baptize people who did not realize that they were supposed to have a repentant heart. You look up there in verse 7, he says, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. It seems as though John the Baptist is sending these guys away and tell them to become repentful. Don't be doing this for vanity's sake, because that's not what it's about. Now, for some hearing this, they're going to believe that you can only be baptized in a church. Well, I don't believe that requirement was of the scripture. Because when you look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is the Messiah talking to all of us. This is called the Great Commission. And it's not just given to pastors or preachers. It's given to everyone, all of the children of the Father, telling all of us to baptize people. So being baptized down at the church, although it may be convenient, it's not necessary. You can be baptized by your spouse or your parent or even your child in your bathtub. You got to understand, it has nothing to do with the person that's doing the baptism. They're not special at all. It has nothing to do with the vessel in which you're being baptized. That's not special. What's special is the water. The first time that I was baptized and felt the fire of the Holy Ghost come upon me, I was baptized in a bathtub by my wife. Two previous times before that, I could look back and recognize no change in my life. But that third time that I was baptized by my wife in the bathtub was a true turning point in my life as I could point to an overwhelming spirit of wisdom that took over my life from that point on. And I believe that it was because of the understanding that I was getting repentance at that point. Whereas before, I was just doing so because somebody told me to do it. That third time was the first time that I had made a decision to do it by the Spirit or on my own, so to say. Now, let's talk about that name there when it was talking about being baptized in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, you have to remember that was the Messiah talking. And to say that for us to be baptized in his name or might not come across as being too humble. Maybe that's why he said in the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. Because when you look up here in the book of Acts, it seems as though we are to be baptized in the name of the Messiah. You look down there in verse 12, he says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And you come down here to chapter 19 of the book of Acts. You see right there, they're talking in verse 12. They're talking about whether these individuals have received the Holy Ghost or not. The spirit of wisdom I was talking about earlier. And they were like, no, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then in verse 3 he says, And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. So now what that's saying is that the baptism of John was different than the baptism that they were expected to do. All of these individuals were baptized not only by John, but by the disciples of the Messiah, who would have carried on the same baptism as, the, as John. But you look right here in verse 4, it says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, says verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
So no longer were they being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but they were being baptized in the name of the Messiah. And then after the fact, you see down there in verse 6, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, I mentioned it that third time that I was baptized by my wife in the bathtub. That was another significant change in from the previous two baptisms, is that I was baptized in the name of the Messiah. Now, back then, I was still calling him Jesus which lends to the idea that it is the understanding of who we are being baptized in. But there are many people today who will be getting baptized in the name Yehoshua HaMashiach. They will be baptized in the name of Yeshua. They will be getting baptized in the name of Yasun, if you understand the Greek, and various other names. But my point is, is that they're being baptized in the name of the Messiah which in my life and according to the scripture makes a difference. And so that may be another reason why we should all be considering getting baptized again, making sure that we are all baptized in the right name, making sure we all get this Holy Ghost being talked about in Acts chapter 19. We look here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, how Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is through this baptism that we receive the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a lot of ministers out there who will argue differently. They will say that you don't have to get baptized, that there's no need to get baptized. And they'll sit there in a congregation full of people and explain to them through sermon after sermon how it is so unnecessary for them to be baptized. But then when you ask them, okay, were you baptized? They'll say yes. Now that reminds me of the Catholic Church. I went to a Catholic Church one time and they was having communion and I noticed that when it came time for the wine, it was only the priest who got to drink the wine while the people in the pews didn't get any of the wine. And that's similar to what's happening when a person tells you that you don't need to be baptized. They're taking of the repentance and telling you that you don't need that repentance. So in essence, they are they have ensured that they have the Holy Ghost, but they don't care whether you get it or not. So don't be fooled when somebody tells you that you don't have to be baptized. They may be trying to trick you. Down here in chapter 8 and verse 16, making a relationship between the Holy Ghost, you see in verse 15, and being baptized in the name of the Messiah there in, in verse 16. Down here at 19, talking about how they were baptized in the name of the Messiah and uh, how they received the Holy Ghost down there in uh, verse 6. The, the reasons for being baptized again are piling up. One, we may have been baptized in the wrong name. Two, we may not have received this Holy Ghost or this spirit of wisdom or the, the, this comforting spirit that we were promised. Three, we were, did not have a repentant heart. Or four, we have somehow soiled ourselves since we got baptized the first time. And probably five or six other reasons that I can't think of right now on how the reasons for getting rebaptized are starting to outweigh the ones to not be baptized again. Now, Jumping down here in the book of Galatians and chapter 3, we can make the understanding that baptism is the token of the new covenant. The same way back there with Abraham, in order to be in the Abrahamic covenant, you have to be circumcised. In order to be in the Mosaic covenant, you have to keep the feast days. In order to be in the covenant of the Messiah, you have to be baptized. You see right there in 27, he says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Meaning we are the children of God by faith in Christ. You see right there in 28, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. 
there is neither male nor female for ye are all in Christ Jesus once we have been baptized in his name baptism is the token of that covenant we jump down here to 1st Peter chapter 3 and 21 it says the like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ we are saved through baptism for those who say that it's unnecessary to be baptized well, we ought to take this verse to them and say, well, is it necessary to be saved? Because it is through baptism that we are saved. Now, notice that part right there. It says, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Now, see, to understand what's going on there, when we think about baptism and what's going on there, how baptism saves us. Well, you heard the story of how we're all sinners come short of the glory of God. That's talking about how we have all broken his commandments and have done bad stuff in the past according to his commandments and according to his rules. Especially those of us who were always taught by the church that we weren't supposed to keep the rules in the first place. That they were antiquated and for those people a long time ago and they didn't keep them and there's no need for us to try to keep them. Well, we didn't even try to keep those rules at all well by breaking those rules we created stains on our spirit and imbalances in the universe that we now have to pay for that's why the world is going through this huge purification process is because we all have a lot of making up to do well through baptism and repentance we actually wash away those sins that were on our spirit before and once our spirit is clean we can become spiritualized individuals again and start to hear our conscience and our conscience is where the father dwells so we can start to hear his voice and start to understand what it is and his will for our life and then taking it a step further as we go into this tribulation with all of these hardships and different trials and stuff that the world is about to go through it's through that inner voice that we can now hear because we have a clean spirit that we can start getting those necessary instructions to help us to be in the right places when some of this bad stuff Stuff comes down up on the earth this this spirit will be leading us from within guiding us the same way they were guided in the wilderness back there by fire and the cloud that fire and the cloud was a living parable of how we will be guided in today by the spirit and by the conscious but we have to have baptism to cleanse away those stains. It is because it is those stains on our conscience and on our spirit that will create separation between us and the Father, making us distant from him to where we can't hear his voice in the first place. And if we go in his tribulation, not being able to hear his voice and get those instructions, we're not going to survive. We're not going to be saved at all. We're not going to make it. If you can't hear the Father's voice, the only other voices that you can listen to are the voices of man or voices of the government, voices of the television. And none of those voices are going to be able to guide you through the tribulation. But let me jump over here to the book of the Shepherd of Hermas because it has some important information on baptism over here. Now, if you aren't familiar with the book of the Shepherd of Hermas, you can find a link to it down there in the description. And you can find many classes that we've done on this book, including introductory classes. But I want to jump over here to the second book of the Shepherd of Hermas called Commands. And I want to look in Command 4. As Hermas is questioning the angel of repentance, he says, And I said unto him, I have even now heard from certain teachers that there is no other repentance besides that of baptism when we go down into the water and receive the forgiveness of our sins, and that after that we must sin no more but live in purity. So Hermas is wanting confirmation from what he heard is that there is no other repentance besides that of baptism. And how baptism cleanses away our sins, 
how we receive forgiveness of our sins through that baptism and have to and how we have to go on to sin no more but live in purity now Herman seems to have a little bit of concern about this as if somehow he's messed up and not lived in this state of purity since the first time he was baptized and so the angel goes on to tell him right there in verse 19 he tells him that is true what you have heard but let me explain this to you right here and I'm paraphrasing here but he says not to make an excuse for those who have sinned and those who plan it on sinning hereafter but let me make this clarification for you and he said unto me thou has been rightly informed nevertheless sin now thou inquirest diligently into all things I will manifest this also unto thee Yet not so as to give any occasion of sinning either to those who shall hereafter believe or to those who have already believed in the Lord. For neither they who have newly believed or shall hereafter believe have any repentance of sins but forgiveness of them. Let's, let me jump down here to verse 21 because the angel of repentance is talking about those of us who did not live in this state of purity since the first time we were baptized. It says, but as to those who have been called to the faith and since that are fallen into any gross sin, the Lord has appointed repentance because God knoweth the thoughts of all men's heart and their infirmities and the manifold wickedness of the devil who is always contriving against the servants of God and maliciously lays snares for them so this is a this is a difference between those of us who have to get baptized again and those who've got baptized the first time now the way I'm understanding this is when it when you baptize the first time you get forgiveness of sins forgiveness of sins meaning you don't have to pay them back but once we've messed up that first baptism and have stained our spirit again like the majority of us have done we get repentance of sins and it says that the Lord has made this provision for us because the Father knows the hearts of man, their infirmities, and the manifold wickedness of the devil who is always contriving something against the servants of God. So the Father knows how it is for us, and so he's given us the opportunity to be baptized again. We should take advantage of that. You look down here in the third book of the Shepherd of Hermes called Similitudes. This is Similitudes 9. Look at here at verse 154. He says, Now that seal is the water of baptism, into which men go down under the obligation of death, but come up appointed unto life. Talking about the seal of the Son of God. That seal that we need in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see up there in verse 152 it says, They therefore being dead were nevertheless sealed with the seal of the Son of God and so entered into the kingdom of God. So if we want to be saved, it, it, we have to have this baptism. And what is this baptism? If we want to be saved, we have to have the seal of God or the seal of the Son of God. And what is this seal? This seal is baptism. Baptism is the seal. Now, we've done classes on the Shepherd of Hermas. The Shepherd of Hermas is a very sophisticated book that explains the hearts of humanity and how we have to change our, the way we are in order to go into the kingdom of heaven. We have to put away those powers that we hear about over there in the New Testament says we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We have to put away those wicked powers out of our life and take on virtues. Well, in this book, the vision that Herman saw was put in all of humanity in the form of stones. Each one of us was depicted as a different stone with different flaws and such. And one of the stones that you'll read about is these stones that says right there in verse 75, and what are the rest which fell by the water and could not roll into the water? He says, they are such as have heard the word of God and were willing to be baptized in the name of the Lord, but considering the great holiness which the truth requires, have withdrawn themselves and walked again after wicked lust. Talking about the people who refuse to be baptized. These are people who considered the great holiness with the truth required and decided they didn't want to live in that truth. They would rather live in wickedness and they went again after their wicked lusts.
these will be of us who refuse to be baptized again as well. We're, we're going after our wicked lusts, and the only way we can be cleansed of those of that wickedness is through baptism. And instead of being baptized again and living clean, we rather just go on and live dirty. But whatever we decide to do, it is New Year's. This is a New Year's celebration. A time for celebrating a new year. Getting off to a clean start maybe should be the thing. But our primary goal should be the purification of our sanctuary. Cleaning out that inner court. Making ourselves ready for the temple of God to fall upon mankind. Talking about New Year's. The real New Year's. Shalom.